nestled on the banks of the scenic Pocomoke River in eastern Maryland is the River House Inn, a charming and historic bed and breakfast. Snow Hill, Maryland is a quaint little town that's uh, located in Worcester County. And you do have a lot of bed and breakfasts in the area, and the River House Inn being one of the more popular and famous old ones. This was a beautiful property, and because it was so beautiful, people would have weddings there, birthdays, graduation parties. The cozy bed and breakfast usually slows down when the weather turns cold. But that wasn't the case in the winter of 2010, when the backyard of this peaceful inn became the focus of a homicide investigation. I remember the day like it was yesterday, February 19th, 2010. It was a cold day. The ground was, was slightly frozen. We walked through the backyard of this historic bed and breakfast. Uh, I think everybody's mood was somewhere between excited that we were, might find an end to this case and upset over the fact that what we were going to find was not going to be a good end. Detectives were carefully following a hand-drawn map, and what they'd unearthed beneath the X would put an end to an agonizing years-long investigation. had welcomed her two young grandsons and her 26-year-old daughter, Christine Shetty, to live with her. I would do anything for Christine, you know. I wasn't the best mom in the whole world, you know. I, I thought maybe this would be my opportunity to be better. Christine was a single mom who had just suffered a bad breakup, and she wanted nothing more than to start a new life over. Christine and I were like two peas in a pod, but when you get two women, living in the same house, you're going to have some issues. She loved her mom to death, you know, but they were both bullheaded, so you would knock heads. And on one cool November morning, an argument over the grocery bill went too far. Christine and I just had a fight. I don't know, she pushed me, I pushed her. I said things, and you know, I can't take back. All I remember is seeing her holding a baby, holding Isaac's hand, and just walking. We didn't say anything, because we were just mad. That's the last time I ever saw her. Christine was an old soul. Would make you laugh. Christine was funny. She was really funny. Had a very giving spirit. There she is. She was rambunctious, comical, and always into something. And this is a nylon shirt. We both ended up having boyfriends about the same time. Her first love, my first love, were friends of each other. Christy met James through hanging out with her friends. It was like one day she was single, next day it was. Where's James? James, nicknamed Jimbo, was a 17-year-old who swept the high school junior off her feet back in 1997. Jimbo was fun-loving, easygoing. They were both comical. Christine loved that he could joke with her. Jimbo was her first love. Jimbo was everything to her. But Christine and Jimbo's young romance was cut short by a tragic accident. James worked as a construction worker, and... James fell off a building, and he broke both his ankles. And in the process, when going through the x-rays, there was a spot found on his leg bone, and it turned out to be Ewing sarcoma. This rare, deadly bone cancer was already advanced by the time James was diagnosed. And after three painful years, he lost his battle. He was her love, above and beyond all. And when he passed, Christine lost part of herself. She took it very hard. Losing Jimbo paralyzed Christine for nearly a year. Feeling vulnerable and desperate for companionship, the 22-year-old found comfort by reconnecting with former classmates and old friends. After James died, and that's when she met Mitch. Mitch was very different from James. I, I thought he was kind of a dullard. Didn't seem to have much going on. and. Uh, he was very controlling, and he had been known to be violent. He was not a good guy. Mitch was not a good guy. 
I tried on several occasions to tell Christine, this is not the guy for you, but the more you pushed, the harder she pushed back. Christine was going to do what she was going to do. Despite their roller coaster relationship, Christine was content spending weekends with Mitch and weekdays with her mom. When she found out she was pregnant, she hoped it would bring she and Mitch closer together. Christine thought maybe this would help smooth things over. And soon baby number two arrived, but Mitch's temper continued to spiral out of control. After a weekend with Mitch, and right before Christine went missing, he had beat her up. She had, you know, the black eye and um, bruises on her arms. Christine was scared to raise her children with the type of father figure that Mitch was. He was very mentally, verbally, and physically abusive to her, and she knew the only way to get out was to get away from him. Christine finally mustered the courage to break up with Mitch, but that meant more time spent at home with her mom. The two constantly butted heads until a particularly bitter argument in November of 2007. Christine took the boys and went to stay with one of her best friends, Tia Johnson, who lived in Worcester County, Maryland, 75 miles away. Christine and Tia, you know, they shared a lot of similar things, like they were both single moms, you know, so they could relate to each other. So when we had a fight, Christine called Tia and go down to the farm just to get away. Tia and her two kids already shared her farmhouse with her boyfriend, Junior Jackson, and her cousin, Justin Hadel, but happily opened her doors to Christine and the kids. I knew that she wasn't leaving for good. It's not like we haven't had these little tiffs before. But two weeks after Christine stormed out, Lynn got the news that no mother ever wants to hear. I got a phone call from Tia's boyfriend, Junior, to say that Christine was missing. And I said, you know, what are you talking about Christine's missing? He said, we checked all around and couldn't find her. I already reported her missing. Even more worrisome, Christine's boys, ages two and four, were left behind. Well, my immediate thought when I got the phone call, I said Christine would never leave her kids. She would never do that. She'd die first. In panic, but we knew something wasn't right. When police got the missing persons report, they went to Bird Road, which was the residence Christine was living at on a small farm. Any missing persons case, the investigators want to try and find out, was there any motivation for the person to leave of their own accord? They found Tia Jr. Um, and Justin there, and they had interviewed all three. Tia reported when she came back home after doing some errands, she discovered that Christine was gone. She was concerned because it was unusual for Christine to leave her children there unattended. And she went outside. She started yelling for Justin and for Junior. They were at the farm, but they weren't inside the farmhouse. And a few minutes later, they came from the area of the woods. When officers questioned them, Justin and Junior said they had no idea where Christine could be. So police began a routine search of the grounds. The deputies take a look around, observing the house and the area around that house. They didn't find anything suspicious. While searching every corner of the farmhouse for her missing friend, Tia discovered an ominous clue. Tia Johnson found a thank you letter from Christine to Tia, thanking her for her cordiality at letting Christine stay at the house, letting the children stay there, and it almost seemed like it was a goodbye letter. Police were baffled. Had Christine left on her own, or was something more sinister going on? Investigators were really concerned about what had happened to Christine because she had no vehicle of her that meant that either she left the property of her own accord on foot or that somebody had come there and taken her off of the property. Investigators start looking at Christine as possibly trying to get rid of her kids and escape. At that point in time, Lynn and the Worcester County Sheriff's Department just didn't get along. In my heart of hearts, I didn't think there was enough being done. So I took it upon myself to search for her.
September 2007, grieving mother Lynn was desperate for answers. Her daughter Christine had disappeared from her friend's farmhouse, leaving her two young sons behind. Less than three hours after she went missing, Christine's concerned roommates told police they had no idea where Christine had gone. The investigators don't think that Tia Jr. or Justin are involved because all three of them are concerned for her safety. All three of them are relaying to the investigators. wrong because it was unlike Christine to leave her boys alone. She couldn't stop thinking that maybe Christine's ex-boyfriend may have had something to do with her friend's disappearance. Tia informed the police that they needed to speak with Mitch Hill, the estranged boyfriend of Christine. We all tried to warn her about Mitch. I knew from prior experiences that he was not a good guy. Mitch was very abusive to my daughter, but Christine was going to do what she was going to do. She loved him. Investigators were now very worried that this person who was an abusive boyfriend may have had something to do with Christine's disappearance. When Christine first went missing, my first gut instinct was that Mitch killed Christine. So investigators go to talk to Mitch Hill. He tells them right up front that he and Christine have had a number of problems uh, over the years, but they've worked on reconciling their differences. Uh, and he tells them that on the day that Christine disappeared, he was working, and he wants to know where Christine is as badly as anyone else. Mitch's alibi was airtight, but he seemed to be holding something back. And when investigators pressed him harder, he handed over a new piece of evidence and it convinced them that Christine may not be missing at all. While talking with the deputies, Mitch offers to give the deputies a journal that uh, Christine Shetty had been keeping. When the investigators start looking through the journal, they discover the names and numbers of three adoption agencies. Police couldn't understand why a doting mother like Christine would want to contact an adoption agency. Could it be that motherhood overwhelmed her? She was looking for a way out? So investigators start looking at Christine as possibly trying to get rid of her kids and, and escape. At that point, they charge her with child abandonment. It was like a big slap in the face for me, because I thought they were, you know, looking for her. So I immediately called down to Worcester County Bureau of Investigation and got the guy on the desk. You know, I just ripped him a new one. Christine would never leave her kids. She has, you know, had her butt beaten and not left her kids. So why would she, you know, leave her kids now? Christine would never put her kids up for adoption. She was wanting to give them a better life. It was unfair because they didn't know Christine. Christine was with her kids 24-7. Lynn knew her daughter wrote in a journal as a way to work through life's hardships. What they don't realize is the way other than act on anything just to get it out even though investigators had come to the belief that christine had left on her own they still continued to conduct searches law enforcement put out a poster for a missing person for christine but even though the poster was out there there were no tips and there was no new information from that avenue Once detectives cleared Mitch Hill as a suspect, they seemed to hit a brick wall. Frustrated by the lack of leads, Lynn was determined to stir things up. Lynn continued to urge law enforcement and push them to do what they needed to do. She never gave up. When Christine went missing, you know, that was kind of like, you know, I can't be quiet. And uh, I promised her I'd never let her down, ever. At that point in time, Lynn and the Worcester County Sheriff's Department just didn't get along. Uh, Lynn would call them constantly, trying to get updates on the case, providing information that Lynn would uh, accumulate on her own. She never let up. I was on the local news. I talked with reporters and newspapers. One way or another, we just need to bring her home. In my heart of hearts, I really, I didn't think there was enough being done. 
So I took it upon myself to go to the farm and search myself. I kind of prepared myself because I was looking for my daughter's body. I even went so far as to Google what uh, state of decomposition I would be stumbling upon. It's something I did, yeah, I guess maybe not. Harden myself, take myself away from it, but I would just walk and look for any kind of sign like clothes or like mounds of dirt. I befriended the neighbor, the next door neighbor. We became really good friends. I mean, we'd walk the woods for hours, like eight hours at a time. As weeks turned into months, Lynn fought back anxiety and despair in her relentless search for Christine. Nearly two years after her daughter's disappearance, she was still in the dark. By 2009, cases were uncalled. There's no new information about Christine. There's nothing on her bank accounts. No one has heard from Christine in almost two years. And all of a sudden, something happens. On March the 24th, 2009, a body is discovered in Westminster, Maryland. March 2009, 15 months after Christine Shetty vanished, a grisly discovery was made in a Baltimore suburb. Somebody is going hiking through the woods in Westminster, Maryland, which is about 150 miles from Pocomo, the place where Christine disappeared. Uh, and this individual discovers the skeletal remains of a young woman who appears to have died from blunt force trauma. Because their skeletal remains, the investigators can't just do a visual confirmation of her identity. But because there are no other missing persons in the immediate area, investigators begin to wonder, could these be the remains of Christine Shetty? My daily routine was get on the computer all day and do research or whatever, trying to find my daughter. And I came across this article that said there was a skeletal remains found in Westminster, Maryland. I was on the phone with Lynn. Um, we kept in communication and we were waiting on pins and needles to see if it was Christine. They said they seemed to belong to a petite female. Okay, my daughter was 5'3", 104 pounds. So I thought this would be Christine. Lynn tried to cope with the awful possibility that Christine had suffered a terrible fate 150 miles away from home. As she mulled over a thousand grim scenarios, she got a call from police. Unfortunately, investigators determined that the skeletal remains ultimately isn't Christine Shetty. They belonged instead to a sex worker from Baltimore missing since 1997. And all of a sudden, all of the hope that Lynn Dota had that her daughter had been found disappeared and she's back to square one the whole thing had kind of like come to a standstill but that was just one of those obstacles that i had to go through you know in order to find my daughter but if the body wasn't christine's then where was she to police the most plausible theory was that christine was trying to get rid of her kids and escape I got a phone call from a detective from a local police department, and he said, let me tell you something, your daughter was a sponge on society because of her lack of work history, and she simply ran away. Christine didn't have a job because her job was them kids. Wherever she went, her children were there, you know, and it's hard being a single mom when you don't have no child support, nothing. Who's going to pay the daycare? Who's going to take care of the tears? I said to the detective, you know what, she was my daughter. Nobody has the right to say like that, and especially somebody that was uh, sworn to protect and to serve. But instead of giving up, Lynn doubled down on her own crusade to find Christine by any means necessary. From the time I got up in the morning until the time I went to bed, I was on that computer. Lynn would call, would email, would just bother anybody and anybody that could help her get the story out about her missing daughter. They were sharing missing persons flyers to all the different media outlets to attention on the case. I was very receptive because I always think about the family and what it must be like. And if you talk to Lynn, 
you know that it was not normal for Christine to take off and, and just leave her kids behind. You know, a lot of people thought maybe Christine ran away or, you know, she gave up. But Lynn, she was going to make sure Christine had justice. You know, on the other side, on the dark side, there was a lot of people that, you know, were really evil. There was another blog, and um, they write, your daughter was a slut, or, you know, that kind of stuff. There were people that were writing in, you know, about they didn't think Christine was you know, worthwhile to look for and this kind of thing. That's what anonymous people do on blogs. Lynn ultimately wasn't willing to just sit around and wait for leads to develop. She ended up being the lead investigator of this case for so long because she just would not let any lead go away. Lynn reached out to anyone who knew Christine, hoping that someone had seen or heard from her. No one had any information, including her close friend, Tia Johnson, who stopped returning Lynn's calls. I figured Tia's a mom, you know, Tia's a woman, and you would think that she'd have some kind of uh, empathy for what I was going through. Lynn wondered, since it had been over two years since Christine went missing from the farmhouse, had Tia simply moved on, or was there more to her story? During the course of Lynn's investigation, she found out that uh, several of Tia's family members thought that Tia knew more than what she had let on. Lynn wasn't about to let anyone off the hook, so she plied Tia for information. So I would, for lack of a better term, stalk her. I would, I was relentless. I would do it publicly on a blog. I would do it, you know, on the radio. I even got on her MySpace and uh, just tore her up. Tia was a dead end. But in February 2010, Lynn's investigation finally turned up a promising lead. Lynn is able to learn that his neighbor's apartment. Junior Jackson, Tia Johnson's boyfriend, was at the farm the day Christine went missing. And now, because of an arson charge, he was prison in Tennessee. So because of his criminal past in Tennessee's third strike rule, Junior was looking at a third strike for a felony arson, and therefore he was looking at life in prison in Tennessee. Junior was desperate to make a deal to avoid prison time and reached out to Lynn with an offer. I advised the state's attorney that we had had fresh information that Junior wanted to talk. And when you get information like that, you have to act very, very quickly. Junior wrote me a letter from jail and he wants to give me what I was looking for for two years. I felt, finally, somebody's listening to me. Finally, somebody believes me. In February 2010, after almost three years of searching for her missing daughter, Christine, Lynn Dodenhoff finally got the break she'd been praying for. A letter from Junior Jackson, Tia Johnson's ex-boyfriend. In the letter, Junior is willing to confess that he knew where Christine's body was and that he would help the Maryland authorities locate that body if they would help him get out of the charges in Tennessee. Junior wants my help, and he would give me my daughter. You know, I was like, finally, you know, finally, there was a light at the end of the tunnel. Prosecutors and investigators were able to work out a deal. They take Junior back to the farm where he, Tia, Justin, and Christine had been living. Junior tells investigators exactly what happened. On the day that Christine disappeared, Tia had gone to uh, run some errands. Christine's children had fallen asleep, and Christine and Junior had gone into the woods to have sex. Junior claimed he and Christine were wildly attracted to each other. But that was a problem for his roommate, Justin Hadel, who had a big crush on Christine. Justin ended up following into the woods a few minutes later, saw the two of them, became incredibly jealous, and ended up getting a shovel coming back to where they were having sex 
and beat Christine with a shovel until she was dead. And that Christine had feelings for him. But was Junior telling the whole story? In many cases, when you have a defendant who is willing to provide testimony against a co-defendant, they're going to minimize their own involvement in whatever happened in order to get out of serious jail time. Junior clearly says that he didn't have any first-hand action involved in the homicide. He just helped after she'd been murdered. According to Junior's story, when Justin has killed Christine, he ends up worried that somebody's going to discover the body, and he also tells investigators that he's worried no one would believe he wasn't involved. So they dig a shallow grave in the woods, cover her body up with some branches and some leaves, and go back to the house. They knew that at some point there were going to be police coming to the property. So at, at that point, they decided they better remove the body from the property on Burt Road and take it to Snow Hill, the River House Inn, bed and breakfast. So they ended up taking Christine's body, putting it along with some shovels in the trunk of the car, driving to the inn, made certain nobody else was at the inn that night. Junior had been working at that bed and breakfast and he knew that there was a ditch that had been dug there it was actually a very deep ditch probably two to three feet and uh, it was just convenient for him junior knew that no one would think twice about uh freshly dug earth because there was already some there so in the backyard of the inn over by one of the fences junior and justin dug a small shallow grave and buried christine thinking that she would be there forever. Junior even went so far as to draw a map to the grave located on the grounds of the picturesque River House Inn. They told me, Lynn, we know exactly where she is. Junior drew out a diagram of where she was. They didn't tell me exactly where. They just said they know where she is. Investigators that were at the farm forwarded that map to investigators that were at the inn who were waiting for that information. The map showed us where the ditch was. There was still grass that hadn't grown on the ditch, so it was pretty easy to follow. And then we proceeded to set up a forensic dig site and start digging. investigators finally had some hope that they would get answers with no leads, no clues, hope ripped away. When he takes the polygraph test, he ends up testing deceptive on one or more of the questions. What that means is that he's lying about his story. of the River House Inn Bed and Breakfast in Snow Hill, Maryland, became the scene of a grim excavation as investigators went digging for Christine Shetty's grave. It was actually a rather lengthy process. Uh, the investigators didn't want to dig too far, too fast, and potentially miss evidence. A shovel full of dirt at a time would be dug up and sifted through to see if there was anything that would point to what had happened to Christine. But hours passed, and there was still no sign of any remains. We had actually dug down a bit and had not found anything, and I think everybody was starting to lose hope until finally we uncovered the tennis shoe, which led to the rest of Christine's body. We found her, you know, we, we found her shoe. We found her, you know, 
and it was, it was surreal. I just burst into tears. It was down to your depths of your soul crying, and, but I knew, I knew I was gonna find her. It was on the news that they found a body. I knew it was her. It was like you, you knew. Um, Lynn said they were waiting, but we knew. When I finally found out that she was at this bed and breakfast, where she was buried is where like bridal parties walked by. It wasn't until nearly two and a half years later, Christine Shetty's remains were found buried in the backyard of the River House Inn bed and breakfast, and Shetty's family is hoping for closure after years of pain and unanswered questions. But this case was far from closed. After verifying his story, that Justin Hadel killed Christine. The investigators talk to Junior and they make a deal with him on a few simple stipulations. One, that he agreed to testify against Justin Hadel. And two, in order to be able to testify, the state was going to require him to take a polygraph test. But when he takes it, the results are not what the investigators were expecting. He ends up testing deceptive on one or more of the questions. What that means is that he's lying about his story. So this put everybody in a little bit of a bind. We now had our primary witness as someone who had been pegged by a science available as a liar. Investigators now needed to find out what was Junior lying about. Did Justin really kill Christine, or was it someone else? Investigators were able to locate Justin in Texas and get him back to Maryland. In February of 2010, Justin Hadel was questioned in a Maryland jail, and what he told investigators turned their case upside down. Justin told investigators that it was Junior not him who was the murderer and that he was only an accessory after the fact and helped with the body and that junior was the mastermind behind what had happened to Christy. with both suspects pointing the finger at one another and no real evidence to prove who was telling the truth police were at a dead end but there was one fact both men agreed on Tia Johnson, Christine's best friend, was in on the plot. They end up getting in touch with Tia Johnson, who's the only person that might know the truth about what happened at the farm that night. I knew she knew, but she wasn't telling. still had no idea who killed Christine Shetty. Junior Jackson and Justin Hadel blamed each other. Both admitted to burying the body, but they weren't alone. Junior and Justin told investigators that they ended up getting Tia involved to help cover up the crime. They ended up taking Christine's body, putting it in the trunk of Tia's car, driving to the end that night, and they buried Christine on the property. According to both Junior and Justin, Tia climbed up the inn's fire escape, broke into a room, and acted as a lookout from an upstairs window. For Lynn, it confirmed her long-held suspicion that Tia was hiding something. I knew in my heart of hearts Tia knew. Well, I had a lot of contempt for her, and I still do. She could have brought this all to an end. You know, at any time, went to the authorities, but she never said anything. After evading Lynn for over two years, Tia Johnson finally came clean about her role in covering up Christine's murder. Then she told investigators that the person responsible for Christine's death was Justin. Tia indicated that Justin had a short conversation with her, and he confessed to her that he had killed Christine the day that she had disappeared. Tia's story was essentially the same as Junior's confession, that 
Justin was the murderer. Tia, a friend of Christine's, who is protecting Junior. She went so far as to throw her cousin Justin under the bus. She had blamed everything on Justin and that she was afraid of telling anybody. But, you know, there was a time when both Justin and Junior were gone and she could have called the police. I don't think that any of the people involved have fully told the truth about what happened that afternoon that Christine died. We ultimately may never know. Both Junior and Justin took plea deals and got 30 years behind bars. As for Tia, she was sentenced to 15 years, 10 for breaking into the bed and breakfast, and five as an accessory to murder. Tia, she got more time for breaking and entering in that bed and breakfast than she did for knowingly transporting my daughter's body in the trunk of her car 10 miles down the road to Snow Hill. When Tia Johnson was convicted of accessory after the fact, the maximum penalty was five years incarceration, and she got that five years. After this case happened, a lot of people looked at the punishment for accessory after the fact and realized it was totally out of line with the severity of the crime, and Lynn led the charge to get the legislature to change the law. I'm very proud to say that uh, we had a law changed in the state of Maryland. It's called the Shetty Bennett Act. It used to be five years for accessory after the fact. Now it's up to 10. This case was about constantly trying to feed information um, and evidence to the detectives that were working the case at the time and constantly hitting a brick wall. She had the information. We were the authority that got it where it needed to go. And ultimately finding Christine as a result of not our work, of Linda Odenhoff's work. I always told her, I said, if, you know, if you ever run away, I said, I will hunt you down and I will find you, you know? And it's kind of funny now because I did it. Christine was one of the strongest women I ever knew. She was a positive person. If you had a bad day, she was one that could have you in hysterics in a heartbeat. She was a good person to lean on. Lynn's life has changed in many ways since her daughter's death, including being a mom all over again. For more than a decade, she's raised Christine's children, who are now teenagers.